Hey, what's going on Authentic Church? Can you believe it's already the end of 2022? I believe that how you finish off a year is important on how you start the next year. And if you want to start strong, I think we need to finish strong. A lot of people are really good at starting strong, but it's a lot harder to finish strong. And so we at Authentic Church decided we are going to incorporate something called the release offering so we can end the year strong so that we can start 2023 even better. And some of you are saying, what is the release offering? Well, our church has decided a few years ago that at the end of the year, we are going to give an offering that goes above and beyond our regular tithes and offering for that day. It's a time where we get to literally activate faith, to get uncomfortable, and to use it to advance the kingdom of God in multiple ways. Let me remind you last year, 2021 at the end of the year, what happened there because we started talking about the release offering and I mentioned that next door we had the new China Inn building just sitting there and we wanted to remodel it and finish it so that we would have a youth building for the next generation. I shouted that vision and everyone began to get excited and expectant and we came up to release offering day and you all gave $27,000 above your regular tithes and offerings. Come on, let's give God praise there. That's amazing. Oh, and this happened too. So will y'all please tell everybody at Authentic Church that an authentic check is coming for a hundred thousand dollars for y'all to continue oh y'all better keep doing what god's called you to do are you serious just like that in one day a hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars came in so we could advance the kingdom of god so thank you so much for your generosity thank you trustees for holding us accountable so we can be the best that we can be with the money that comes into our church. So we got to work. In March, we started going right into the youth building and we started tearing down the walls and preparing it. And we've been working nonstop. And I'm so grateful for everyone who's had a hand in that. We have the drywall up. It is being taped in mud and soon to be painted. It is getting done. And we are so close to opening up what we're gonna be calling the 820 building next door so the next generation can continue to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we didn't stop there with the release offering. We took 10% of that and we threw it right back into impactful outreach. We've used it for our Serve Saturdays throughout the year. We have used it for Mosaic. We've sent money to Hope Pregnancy Center. We've helped church planners. We've helped the Boys and Girls Club. We've helped teachers make better uh, purchases for their classrooms so that their students can learn in a fun environment. You are all making a difference because you finished strong. We were able to start strong. And here we are coming at the end. And on December 11th, as our church celebrates turning 10 years old on our 10th birthday, we are going to act in faith again and we are going to release an offering above and beyond our tithe and offering to see how we can finish strong so we can start strong in 2023. So start praying if you haven't. Start preparing and ask God what he's putting on your heart because we have this opportunity that I believe we can see God work again in our church and it's going to accomplish so much for the kingdom of God. So December 11th, come prepare because God's going to use you to help more people look like Jesus in their everyday lives. Hey, I don't have a long word for you today. Here y'all buzz laugh. Some people are like, shut up, idiot. Well, I don't have a long word for you today, but I do have a powerful word for you today. Uh, my name is Sean Jensen, by the way, I never said that, I'm the pastor here, and that just means I get to serve y'all uh, with God's word in other ways, and so I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving, I know I did, I had some smoked turkey, and some ham, and then some more ham, and I had a lot more ham, and I just ate all the ham, all the ham, uh, it was super good, and then we watched A Christmas Story Christmas last night, and y'all, I was just living in nostalgia, so it was fantastic, so we're glad that you're here, thank you for coming out, you could be anywhere else, and We've been in a series we've been calling Looking Forward, and uh, if you're joining us today and you're like, Sean, I'm, I'm from out of town, I'm not going to be here, you can check them all on YouTube. So if you enjoyed today and you want to learn more about Looking Forward, all of our series are on YouTube and you can check it out. But we've been in a series where we've been looking ahead, and here's why. Because we believe that where we look to in the future will determine the steps we take in the present, right? 
What we focus on in the future will determine what we do in the present. And so we've been telling ourselves for followers of Christ, man, we got a good place that we're going, eternal things, and we're not just going to live for the present. We're going to live for the next generation. And so everything we do, our generous lifestyle, which we learned about the first week, we learned about obedience last week. If we can just live a generous life and an obedient life, we will leave a legging la- a, a, a legacy for our children. And so we've been looking at that. And so I was preparing today, and I told you last week, and I'm sorry I do this, that we're going to be looking at Rahab. We're going to be looking at a woman in Scripture. We've been in the book of Hebrews 11. If you're joining us, that is literally the hall of faith. If you were to take the Bible and go to Hebrews 11, it's full of names of people that God used to do great things, and they call it the hall of faith because if you made it in that chapter, you're like in the hall of fame. But the cool thing is, is all the people who did these extraordinary things were ordinary people, just like you and I, which means that if you're ordinary today, God can do extraordinary things through you. So we talked about Abel, and then we talked about Abraham, and last week I said, listen, we're going to talk about a lady this week, because we've been talking about men too much, so we're going to talk about women. So I had Rahab, the prostitute, by the way, the prostitute made it into the hall of faith. So if you think you're too far gone, God can use you too to do great things for God. But as Monday came, I really sensed as I was falling asleep, God dropped something on my heart. And so we are not looking at Rahab, maybe in the future, but I have something I feel like I need to share with you today. And someone in here must be loved by God so much because he changed my whole message on Tuesday because you are here, because you need to hear this word. So I really believe that. But here's one thing I want to speak over you. There is freedom in your future. There is freedom in your future. I I need you to believe that, and I need you to hear that today. There is freedom. See, see, when I was writing this, by the way, I wrote that. I was like, man, that's going to excite the church. No, everyone wants to hear that there's freedom in your future, but it sounds like you just don't believe it. (laughs) Like, there is freedom in your future. Hebrews 11, 20 says this. This is who we're going to look at today. By faith, Isaac, who was dad, blessed Jacob and Esau, his sons, in regard to their future. That's all I got for you today. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. If you're new to church, you don't know anybody, any names, that's fine. I'm going to tell you who these people are, but we've got to look at this in a moment. We see a father bless his sons in regards to their future. And I want to tell you today, the name of the message is, there's freedom in your future. And I believe that for anybody in this room, there is actually freedom in your future, even if you feel stuck right now. I know it's a bold statement, but I'm going to make that bold statement today that there is actually freedom in people's future today. So I want to pray that over you. Lord, I just pray right now that we would receive that word, that if you have freedom for us, we want it. And I just pray, Father God, Lord, that you help us get it. In Jesus' name, amen. My question for you as we start today's message is this, have you ever been tricked before? Have you ever been tricked before i'm a prankster i was raised in like a pranks like a pranks pranks home like my dad was a prankster and and so we do a lot of tricks and pranks and so right now if you don't know on tiktok there's this like filter uh by the way uh one of our own is super famous on tiktok right now just let you guys know 4.8 million views last week two weeks ago we talked about tithing so when you hit the big stuff but anyways on TikTok, there's a filter where spiders actually crawl on people's face, and it's a fake filter, and it freaks out. And now I can't explain it to you because it doesn't sound as good, so I brought you a video just to show you exactly what this prank looks like that's trending. He hates spiders. This filter is so cool. Check it out. Y'all, I hate spiders. Uh, I couldn't show you the ones I wanted to show you because of all the swearing in them. (laughs) Because they're like punching each other, like slapping each other in the face. Uh, But I was like, this is a great filter. And so I decided with my three daughters, I'd pull it on the two oldest ones. And uh, sure enough, as I was showing them the video, the spider landed on my most dramatic uh, daughter in that moment. And my wife was in the other room. And I'm just telling you, if you live within like a mile of Henry Street, My kids are just fine. I was playing a ridiculous prank on them with Scream. She screamed at the top of her lungs. And then she gave me a look like, I hate you, Daddy. Like, I will never never say that, but you know it, like, right now. And you know the face of betrayal when you've been tricked? 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever been tricked before, and I know that we do it for all good and fun, and, and we talk about Thanksgiving, the laughing memories of what happened in the past, and there's some good tricks and pranks where honestly have happened, and you laugh about them from years to come, but then honestly, if you've been tricked and it's actually real, like, you know, like the real betrayal, somebody like, Sean, I've been tricked before, but you know what? I'm not laughing about it. Actually, I'm still going to counseling for it. Uh, I've been tricked before, but the betrayal was so real that it's not a laughing memory. It's a painful memory. And so when I say, have you been tricked before, some people in here are like, yeah, I have. I've been pranked before. And some of you are like, yeah, I have. And it still hurts. Actually, I've been tricked by people who were in the church who I thought were real friends, and they betrayed me, and they hurt me. Like, Sean, why are you asking, have we ever been tricked before? Because when you look at Jacob and Esau in this moment, Esau had a painful memory of being tricked by his brother named Jacob. Now, you may not know who Jacob is, you may not know who Esau is, but let me unpack this before because Jacob was the prankster. He was the trickster. His name actually meant deceiver. That's what his name meant. It said that when he was born, Esau, his brother, was born first, and it said that literally Jacob was grabbing onto his heel when he came out. They were twins, but Esau's like, I'm I'm going to try to get in front of you. His name was deceiver and his dad was Isaac. Last week we talked about Abraham. Abraham couldn't have children. God finally blessed him with a child. His name was Isaac. Isaac has children. You have Jacob and Esau. Now hear me out. How was Esau tricked to the point where he was pained and he felt like betrayal? What happened was Jacob was younger and Esau was older. And in that culture, the oldest brother would get a birthright. A birthright was a big deal in that culture. What it meant in that culture was if you were born first, you were going to be the one that gets all the inheritance, all the blessing, and everything from your father's livestock, cattle, land, whatever he has, when he leaves, you get all of it. And not just that, it was an honorary thing. You would tell people, I'm the oldest, I have the birthright. It was a big deal to have the birthright. I can't really explain it to you in this culture, but it was a big, big deal. Well, Jacob was a little jealous of that, and his mom actually was too, because Jacob was his mom's favorite. Actually, Jacob's mom had a favorite, and it was Jacob. Esau was a hunter, so while he was out hunting and killing deer and shooting bears and hunting lions and finding all the food in the game to eat, Jacob was at home, it says, and he would be the one who prepared the meals, a.k.a. Jacob was a mama's boy, guys. That's who he was. Uh, There's nothing wrong with being a mama's boy. That's just who he was. However, one day Esau was out on a long hunt campaign doing his thing. It's probably shotgun season. He comes back and he is starving and he is famished. When he comes back, Jacob knew he'd be coming back. And so he had deer chili going for like a whole day. You know, like when it gets to the point where you can actually start smelling the spices in the house and you walk in like, oh my gosh, make some cornbread. Let's go. He had it going. And that time, Esau comes in the room. He's starving. He is hungry. He feels like he's going to die. He goes, give me some of that food. It smells so good. How many people know that when you don't eat, everything sounds good? When you are, when you are hungry, anything sounds good. That's why we got to be careful if we don't find fulfillment in Christ. Because when we are spiritually starving, everything sounds good but only Jesus can satisfy. Well, he's like, give me some of that deer chili. And he goes, I'll give you some. And so he gets it ready and he puts it down there. And Esau's like, woo! And right before Esau digs in, he goes, hold on. And he goes, wait a second. Is there a catch? He goes, yeah, sell me your birthright. He goes, I ain't, give me my food. I'm starving. He goes, sell me your birthright and I'll give you a bowl of stew. We find out in scripture that Esau was so hungry. He said, fine, you can have my birthright. And he gets his bowl of soup. He literally sold his birthright, his blessing for a bowl of soup. And we give Esau a bad rep, but how many things have we traded in our life for a quick fix? How many relationships have we suffered from a quick fix? How many things have we done because we chose something more temporary than permanent because we were starving? It says he was in contempt and he hated Jacob for doing it. He had so much anger towards him, but he didn't stop there. Because later on in life, while Esau was out hunting, it was time for Isaac was getting too old and he was almost blind. He was going to bless the children, which means he was going to now give the blessing to Esau for him to take everything. In this moment, Esau's out hunting, and Isaac's wife literally looks at Jacob and says, hey, you're going to steal your your brother's blessing. Here's what you're going to do. 
He goes, go make some food, prepare them food because that's what Esau is going to do. Go get some goat fur, put it on your arms and your legs, and I want you to get Esau's clothes, and I want you to put Esau's clothes on, and I want you to go to your father who can barely see, and I want you to tell him you're Esau. And so in scripture, we see this moment where he walks in, and Isaac's like, hold on, is that you? He goes, yeah, it's me, it's Esau, even though it was Jacob, and he comes closer, and he feels the goat hair on his arms. He goes, oh, Esau is hairy. This is Esau. Jacob has the baby, the baby bottom skin. But you, you haven't been moisturizing. You got, you got, (laughs) you got uh, some hair on your arms. And he smelled his clothes and he prepared the food and he ate it. And then he literally blesses Jacob and gives him the blessing that actually is intended for Esau. Esau gets home at that exact moment when Jacob walks out. He comes in, prepares a meal, makes a meal, comes in after the hunt, ready for his blessing, and then it says Isaac begins to shake. He goes, who are you? He goes, it's me, Esau. I'm ready for my blessing. And in that moment, Isaac realized, I messed up. I gave your blessing to your son, the younger one, but you were supposed to get it. Betrayed by his own brother hurt by his own brother, a trick that left him in pain. But Hebrews tells us that Isaac gave a blessing to both Jacob and Esau. Esau was so mad, he goes, can you give me something? I may not get the blessing, but can you give me a blessing? Can you just speak something in my life? Can you promise me something from God? Because he was so angry and so upset. So in this moment in Genesis, we see all this happen, and this is what Esau says and what his dad says back in Genesis 27. It says, Esau pleaded, but do you have only one blessing, oh my father? Bless me too. Then Esau broke down and wept. He was so hurt. He was so tricked. Finally, his father Isaac said to him, you will live away from the richness of the earth and away from the dew of the heaven above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. It was supposed to be the other way around, but don't miss this blessing. But when you decide to break free, you will shake his yoke from your neck. Don't miss that last part. But when you decide to break free, you will shake his his yoke or that slavery of being attached to your brother from your neck. Remember the name of the message? There is freedom in your future. Here's the catch. There is freedom in your future, but you have to make the decision. There is freedom in our future, but when you decide to break free, then you will experience freedom. I came to tell you today that there is freedom in many of our future, but it's still our decision. Can I tell you, some of us are only one decision away from a future freedom. Some of us are only one decision away from future freedom in our life. God's provision is freedom, but it's our decision that we have to make. So what is it? If God's provision is freedom, then our decision must be forgiveness. See, this week, I feel like God completely shifted what we are looking forward to. And if we're looking for freedom in the future, then we got to forgive in the present. It's hard to leave a legacy. And if you want to leave a legacy of bitterness and unforgiveness, I have seen generation upon generation upon generation still be awful because we have passed down bitterness and unforgiveness to our children. And we do not want to leave a legacy of slavery. We want to leave a legacy of freedom. This week, I felt like the Holy Spirit led me this way because he said there are people in this room who need to break free once and for all. You got to make a decision today, whatever happened to you, whatever betrayed you, whatever you are fighting against, the person you're still bitter at, when you decide to break free, then you shall be free. See, God's provision is freedom. Our decision is forgiveness. So my goal today is that today would be the day that you break free. You break free from the years of pain. You break free from the years of hurt, the ones who betrayed you, the ones who stabbed you in the back, the ones that you're trying to get revenge in, the ones that you're trying to get payback in. Why? Because that's what exactly what happens when someone hurts you, when they betray you. You are bitter and you want payback. Why? Because they need to pay. Man, I I love revenge. Some of my favorite movies are revenge movies. Have you seen Taken? That movie's awesome. Why do you think we love it? Because revenge. The Revenant, are you serious? Leonardo DiCaprio gets attacked by a bear, and for two and a half hours, he finds the person who killed his son, and he goes, you're going down. Let's go. Why? Because we love good payback. We love revenge. Nothing makes us feel better than when the person who ruined our reputation, we make him feel like an idiot in front of other people. But it works for a minute, and we're still bitter for a year. 
He says when you break free, not when you get paid back. There is freedom in your future. Now, today's message is about forgiveness, if you haven't told by now. And so my question is this. Are you still angry about something that was stolen from you? Are you still angry about something that was stolen from you? Because that's where it starts, by the way. Esau was upset because of what was stolen. His birthright, even though he gave it to him, it was stolen. He was tricked. And now his blessing. I can tell you, if you're dealing and harboring and you're not forgiving, based on continually thinking about the thing that was stolen from you, can I ask you, what was stolen from you? Was it a relationship maybe that you spent all of your time for the last eight years pouring into and this person didn't reciprocate that love and they left you high and dry? They stole my time. Is it the reputation that you had and even though you didn't do it but they spread false rumors about you? They stole your reputation. Is it, I don't know, something to do with a workplace or maybe it's a coworker, maybe something happens to you and it just doesn't feel fair. And they stole some from, maybe it's a father figure in life who was never there. They stole the best years of your life because you don't even know what a father. He st- they stole your father from you just by leaving. And maybe if we're honest with today, if you're anything like me, I steal, I'm, the one who steals the most from me is me. It's hard to forgive myself. I know Jesus forgave me, but I don't forgive me. And we wrestle with these things. I know after Thanksgiving, we're full, and you're probably like, oh, Sean, I'm still in like a turkey coma. I really don't want to talk about forgiveness. Can you just tell us that our freedom is, you know, in the future, and let's leave it at that? I am. Your future is freedom, but you got to decide to break free. And I don't know who's sitting this in this. I don't have to go deep to find out there's some people in your life <laughs> that make you angry because they stole from you. I, you know how I know? Here's the number one way, because I'm learning from experience. I don't think I'm dealing with unforgiveness or bitterness. Let me, let me tell you, when this person's name gets mentioned, do you scowl or do you smile? Do you still argue with this person when you're in a room by yourself? Some of you are laughing, but it's your own husband. <laughs> and now you just made your husband laugh for laughing too loud. Now it's your wife. <laughs> and what happens with our kids? And the, Can I tell you that Esau and Jacob were brothers, which shows me that sometimes the people who hurt us the most are the ones who are closest to us. Because we have such high expectations for them that when they hurt us, we don't understand it. So Esau's like, what the heck of all people, you're my brother, but we can hold it. And now we live in a culture, y'all, we can't even make a post without offending someone. Y'all, did you see? No, don't go there, Sean. Don't go there. No, it's just just, just the the PETA graphics this year were hilarious. Posting about, I can't even eat my Thanksgiving with feeling shame. (laughs) But everyone's mad about something, and we're all angry about something. But if I was honest with you, who is that thing that you keep talking about? You know, like, God asks you to pray for them, but instead you put curses upon them. Like, every time their name is mentioned and people actually have good things to say about them, you want to remind them of the bad things about them. But I would come to find out that in my own life as a leader and as a pastor, when I used to do the same thing, I realized, like, man, I wouldn't want my life to be dictated by one bad moment in my life. We got people leaving churches because they're imperfect. Because people in the church has hurt them. Which is weird because the church is for sick people, not healthy people. And so the moment you go to a church that will never hurt you or have people who are flawed, the moment you find that perfect church, the moment you walk in, you've made it imperfect because you are flawed too. But how do we wrestle with this? Knowing we're going to be hurt, knowing we're going to be, and I'm not saying the thing that happened, maybe it's showing you this is more intense. It was an abuse. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, how much longer are we going to live in bondage when, when our future is freedom? I am not telling you to forgive because they didn't hurt you. I'm telling you to forgive so you can find freedom. That's what I want for you. And I know it's hard sometimes. I know it's difficult because you really want to prove yourself and you want to say exactly what happened in that room and you want everyone to know. But you know what? No one else may ever know besides you and God. And if God knows and he cares about what your situation is, he can take care of it. 
Leave it in his hands, but what was stolen from you? See, when something is stolen from us, someone has to pay. So if you're like me and you deal with anger, what is anger? Anger is this. Someone stole something from me, and now I'm going to make them pay it back. And until they pay it back, I'm going to be angry. Did you know one of the best ways to overcome anger in your life, not that anger is a sin, is sinning in your anger. Did you know that finding out how to find anger in your life and locating it is finding out who has hurt you and if you've forgiven them? Because you're constantly living like, you have a debt to pay, you have a debt to pay, you have a debt to pay, you have a debt to pay. Liam Neeson is not smiling while he's killing his sister, like, oh, like in Taken. He's not, he's not smiling while he's chasing after his daughters like kidnappers. He's angry because until he gets that back, and maybe we're in that place. So just a couple things real quick, and then I'm going to pray for you. A couple things real quick to think about maybe why you should time to forgive, even if it's hard, even if it's difficult. Here's why. Because what was stolen doesn't have to keep stealing. What was stolen doesn't have to keep stealing. Listen, don't let what one moment of stealing produce many moments of stealing. They may have stole a moment of your life. Don't let them steal your life too. They may have stole one day of your life, but don't let them steal your entire life too. Maybe they stole their childhood. Don't let them steal your adulthood too. They may have stole your peace. Don't let them steal your joy too. You know what I'm saying? We, what we tend to do is we, they steal from us and it hurts and it's awful, but why would we want them to steal more time? And I know it hurts and I know it's painful, but if we could remind ourselves, I know they stole from me here, but I'm not going to let me steal from my children too. I know your father wasn't there, but why are you going to let him steal your relationship from your children? I know mom wasn't there or she treated you this way and you never felt good enough and you never felt like it was like this, but why are you going to let that hurt steal from your relationship with your children? You hear what I'm saying? The best thing we can do is forgive. Why? If we're going to do it, listen, don't let one moment of someone stealing from you turn into a lifetime of stealing from you. See, Jacob stole his birthright, but he didn't steal his life. Jacob stole his blessing, but he didn't steal his life. Why would we let them steal any more time? I know it's hard. It's like, Sean, they stole my trust, but they didn't steal your peace. I know they stole my money, but they're not going to steal my joy. I know they stole my past, but I'm not going to let them steal my future. So what can I do? I got to forgive. I got to forgive. Or I need justice. I need revenge. Now, I'm all about justice and people going through the right things. If something happened, we need to make sure people have justice, but we still got to forgive them from our heart. There's a scripture in Deuteronomy that I love so much. It, looks, it reveals who God is. We don't live under the law in the Old Testament anymore, but I love the character that God is in this moment. Look at what he says. He says, and when you and your children return to the Lord, your God, and obey him with all your heart, with all your soul, according to everything I commanded you today, then the Lord, your God, listen, will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the nations where he scared you. I love this. He said, you were in exile. These people were hurting you. Babylon was taking from you. All these things were happening. But when you follow me with your whole heart, you chase after me, listen to what he says, and you return, the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He doesn't say get payback. He doesn't get say revenge. He says, come back to Christ and have compassion, it says on you, and I will gather you again from all you've done. Why? Because we can get revenge for stolen time, or we can allow God to restore the stolen time. I believe that our God is so good that when we live lives of forgiveness, the time that was stolen from us, God is able to restore it back. God is able to restore it back. I believe if you feel like you were destroyed for two years of a life, if you chase after God, he will show you something greater than the two years that were stolen from you. Instead of spending your whole life getting revenge, maybe you should focus on God and let him restore. Because the revenge is not going to restore the five years that they hurt you. It's still going to be there. But if you give it to God and allow forgiveness to work in your heart, he's going to restore the years that were taken from you. He's the only one that can change time. He's the only one that can see your future. He's the only one that can change and orchestrate things in a way that can lead you to blessing. He is the only one. Getting revenge may seal up the past, but trusting in God will set you up for your future. He wants to restore you. He wants to renew you. He wants to give you hope and a future, but you have to decide, am I going to break free? Am I going to break free? Man, I don't know why this seems like it's so heavy. If I was sitting in those seats, I know in my life there's some people that I'm working on forgiving every single day. 
And I've learned in my life, I have lived in places that have robbed and stolen from me. My relationships have been stolen. My peace has been stolen. My leadership has been stolen. My reputation has been stolen. Man, I, I've lacked self-control because of my anger. But the more I learn to forgive, God begins to restore the years that were taken from me. Man, I look at people in this room who were physically abused, sexually abused. There were some things that happened that I have not even come across, and they have decided to forgive. And when I look at their life, I'm saying, oh my gosh, God is restoring the time that was stolen from you. But you got to believe that when you live in forgiveness, God can restore everything that was taken from you. What was stolen from you? See, just because they stole from you doesn't mean they need to keep stealing from you. Can I encourage you to forgive? Don't let them steal any more time from you. No more time. The last thing is this. They may have affected your life, but they don't have to control your life. They don't control me. Your attitude just shows it. They control the way you talk about things. They control the way you look at life. Instead of having faith and wonder, now you live like critical and cynical all the time. They already are controlling. This moment has controlled our life, and I have been there. They may have not affected your life, they may have affected your life, but that doesn't mean they have to control your life. It affected Esau's life when his birthright was stolen. It affected Esau's life when his blessing was stolen. But just because something may have affected your life for that moment doesn't mean they have to control it for the rest of your life. There's a very unique language that Isaac, the blessing, you're like, Sean, how is this a blessing that he preaches over Esau? What did he say? When you decide to break free, right? When you decide to break free and shake, I love this, shake his yoke from your neck. Sean, I don't even know what yoke is. Let me explain it from you. This is what he's saying when he says, when you decide to break free and shake the yoke, what is a yoke? In that time, they had farming equipment. They didn't have like GPS, combines, you know, where you sit in there and they drive for you and do all their things. I'm like, I don't have one of those. I, they don't have a combine. They didn't have the things that till up the land for you. So what they did, they had to plow. And I know like a lot of tractor stuff have the mechanisms that plow up the ground, but then they would use oxen because those were some sturdy animals. They were big animals. And so if you had one oxen, you could plow a field, but they needed more power sometimes. So they wanted two oxen. So what they would do is they would have this thing called a yoke. The yoke would actually be this wooden thing that would connect two oxen together. So you get like, you know, like horsepower, you get like oxen power. Like my plow's got two oxen power, right? Like the 5.0. Anyway, so so people, you know, come up and what they would do is they would yoke oxen together and then they would tie the plow to it and then the oxen would pull. What's really neat about this is a lot of times you would notice which ox was more powerful and which one was not, which didn't really matter because they were doing the same thing. But the one who was more powerful would end up honestly steering that plow. The other one was used for power. So the moment those things were yoked, they were yoked together working at the same time. Jacob... The moment he deceived Esau, Isaac said, the moment that happened, he put a yoke on your neck. You are now attached to Jacob because of what he has done. And Jacob is the more powerful one because he has something against you. What does this mean? It means that that person may not even live in your county or state anymore, but they're still ruining the relationships that you're in. It means that you can't get close to anybody anymore because what they did 15 years ago is still controlling how you talk to people today. It means that you're still yoked to someone even though they're not around. He wasn't talking about a physical yoke. He's saying, hey, if you don't shake free from this, this thing will control you the rest of your life. Let me say it this way so you understand. Uh, when we and my wife just met, we are, we are celebrating 12 years of marriage in January, y'all. We have made it. We know everything about marriage. Everything is great. It's perfect. If you need any expert advice, come to us. We know it all. Uh, so, shit, it's all Thanksgiving this week. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the truth is, though, is when I first met my wife, we met in Tulsa, and we were playing basketball at my, where I lived at, and we had a basketball hoop, and we had friends over, and I was really trying to impress her. We weren't, like, dating at this time. We were just hanging out, and, like, basketball is my game, so you better believe I was, like, showing off, right? So I was like showing off and, and playing basketball and I was showing off and also flirting. And so when we were playing and shooting, she had her back turned to me and I took the basketball and I bounced it off her butt. Just flirting, you know, Not, don't advise this. Uh, I was like, I'm so cute. Like, check it out. And I just bounced off her butt and brought it back. And she was like waiting for the shot. And in that moment, I was like, I'm so funny. I saw like within a blink of an eye in that moment, I was in a headlock fighting for my life. <laughs> 
I don't even know what happened. I blacked out. But all I know is my future wife had me in a headlock, and it wasn't like, oh, you're so cute. I can't wait to get married and have your baby someday, headlock. It was a, I'm going to end your life forever, headlock. And I remember I'm fighting for my life. I'm like, Ooh! And I'm like, I'm just PTSD, y'all. Like, I'm just like, what is going on? And, uh, and as she has me in a headlock, I can feel, I look up and I'm laughing. I'm like, I said these words, like, like Liz! I'm not your brother. <laughs> now, all my ladies in here who have older brothers know exactly what just happened when I said that. You were traumatized your entire life by your older brother. You had to fight for yourself. See, she had to fight for herself. We love her brother and everything, but he, he, he got her good. He would do some crazy, she's told me horror stories of her having to fight for her life because her brother would pick on her and, 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 and attack her and all these different things. He's a great guy, but I'm just trying to say that she had this moment. And so the moment I threw the basketball off her butt, her was, my brother's picking on me again. I'm going to end his life. <laughs> not, this could potentially be the guy I spent my entire life with. I better not ruin this. <laughs> she told me later, she goes, did you like second guess it? I was like, I third guess it, girl, like that. <laughs> It's like, good thing you look great, because, and you knew how to play guitar, because that's the only thing that could help calm me. Um, why do I say that? Because something that happened in her childhood was still affecting her relationships as adulthood. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Because she had to forgive her past, so it stops controlling her, her future. Some of you, every time someone gets close in your life, they do something that reminds you of what the other person who betrayed you did. And their motive is pure and the other motive wasn't. But because it just triggers you, you're already allowing that person to control you and you start escaping from a relationship that might bless you. And so you just turn it off every time. Every time someone gets close, you hurt them. Every time someone gets close, I can't trust you. And so now you live in a place that you can't trust anybody because someone broke your trust. Now you feel like you can't trust anybody. And so there's no one in your life speaking into you. There's no one in your life that's hurting it. Maybe right now you're on your second marriage and maybe it's tough and maybe it's difficult because someone in the first one did something to you and you have yet to forgive them. Can I tell you, if you don't forgive the first marriage, you will live in paranoia in the second one. Not because what they did, but because they're still controlling you. Y'all, hear me what I'm saying. We have all been betrayed. We have all been hurt. But until we break the yoke, that thing will control us in our relationships with our kids, in our relationship with others. And God is saying, it's time to break the yoke. It's time to break the yoke. It's time to shake free from it. So my question is, how much longer are we going to let these people control our lives, our futures, our relationships, our intimacy with our spouse, our cynicism with our church. Listen, we have people leaving the church in groves because someone hurt them in the church. Now, there is real church hurt, and the reason I've been sitting on this is because I see it all the time. I saw someone post just this week. The people in the church are the ones who hurt you the most, so I'm never going to church. I'm like, that is the dumbest thought ever because what you're saying is the church needs to be perfect. I don't want to go to a church that acts perfect, but you're leaving the church because it's not perfect. I, I don't want to go to a church that acts perfect. I want them to be real and raw. And then we leave. They weren't perfect. Y'all, I'm hitting something today because no one's going, that. that's good. And what do you do? You might have got food poisoning at one restaurant, but you're still choosing all the other restaurants in town. But we have one person that get hurt in church, and they say no to the Big C Church forever. Why? Because there's nothing more that the enemy would like to do to put a yoke on your neck and prevent you from finding future in your freedom. Y'all, it's time to forgive. We have to shake until the yoke breaks. So that's my thing for you today, is who is in your life that you got to forgive? Who is in your life that you know this message is for? I know this wasn't a pretty message. I didn't have it all together like my last few messages, but here's the word of the Lord today. It's time to forgive. It's time to let it go. It's time to say, you don't know what they did to me. I don't. You're right. But I know God has a bigger future than what your past looked like. 
And I'm just trying to tell you this is the moment that God can supernaturally. I talked to two guys this month, two of them, that are on their journey. They're running after Christ. They had some setbacks and some hardships. And you would even think, are they Christian? What's going on? But they, had a fa- they were raised in the faith, and they kind of ran. They had this issue or whatever. I talked to two guys in the last month, and they literally looked at me and said, I don't know what it was. They're on fire for God, and, and they're running back, and praise God for that. I'm not even saying they ever left, but they were having their own journey. And the both Guys, I talked to, I said, what do you think it was? They said, I don't know what it was, but there was something in my heart when I was praying. God said, you need to forgive this person. The moment I realized that God forgave them in my heart, everything changed in my life. Both guys I talked to realized it was unforgiveness that robbed them of their future. And the moment they decided to overcome that forgiveness, God is bringing blessing back into their life. Two guys. So what happened with Esau, Sean? What happened with Jacob? Well, Jacob goes and does his own thing. He robs him. Years later, he has his own family. He's got two wives. It's a cultural thing. God does not agree with it. Don't, don't look at that. He's got all these kids. He finds out that Esau is above the way. He's ahead of the way. And so he finds out Esau is just up the ways, and so Jacob starts freaking out. He's like, oh, my gosh. The last time I know Esau was what I said at the Thanksgiving table. <laughs> The last, thing I, the last time I saw Esau, this is what happened. The last time I saw this person, I stole from him. And so he sends 400 livestock up ahead to say, let's just butter him up to make sure, like, hey, we're good, right? Everything's good. So Jacob is walking with his family, about to ready to meet the brother that he stole everything from, who left literally scheming to kill Jacob years down the road. I don't know what's going in Jacob's mind, but as he goes up, we see this moment where he sees Esau. He drops to his knees. He bows down seven times, which is a cultural respect for him. Jacob sees Esau. Esau looks at him and tells him to get up. And in Genesis 33, 4, this is what Esau does. Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. And they both wept. When you decide to break free, how do I know when I broke free from this? You'll start blessing the people who persecute you. You'll start blessing the people who hurt you. You'll start blessing and praying for the people who betrayed you. Just like, I don't know, Jesus, when he was on the cross, and with his final breath, he looked at everyone who put him on the cross, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I'm dying for their freedom, and I'm not going to come off this cross because they hurt me. I'm going to show them my love for them by blessing them, even though they put me on this thing. So if Christ could forgive us, it's time to look like Jesus and forgive them. Oh, when we tell you to go look like Jesus, we actually mean forgive people too. Not just do good works. We never look more like Christ than when we forgive those who hurt us. How can I look like Jesus this week? You can forgive those who hurt you. But I don't understand why they did it. You never will. But I can tell you, I'm not teaching this, you this message because they don't deserve payback. I'm teaching this message because God wants you to have freedom. This may be your husband. This may be your wife. This may be a friend. This may be a bully. This may be whoever. But today, there's freedom in your future when you decide to break free. When you decide to break free with eyes closed in this place. I felt like I wanted to take a quick moment just with you in this place. I just wanted to take a quick moment. Whoever hurt you, whoever came against you, this is the moment you forgive them. See, he said you got to shake that yoke. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean you can't do it. You're like, Sean, I feel like I have to keep doing it. Absolutely. Every day, you got to forgive you got to look for ways to bless them. you got to look for ways to pray for them. And I'm telling you, you will find freedom in your life. So Lord, I pray right now as we release these people to you, we're saying, I'm breaking free. We're saying, I'm breaking free. Lord, I pray right now for anyone in this room who feels like they need to break free, I pray they would respond in faith right now. This is between you and God. I can't force this. You need to put that person right there and you need to say, God, I'm breaking free from and tell God who it is. Come on, right in this moment, Lord, I'm breaking free from. Maybe there's four people I'm breaking free from, I'm breaking free from, I'm breaking free from, I'm breaking free from. 
Lord, I forgive them. Lord, I forgive them. No more controlling. No more fighting. Lord, I, I'm breaking free from. Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would help us break free from those hurts and those pains because, Lord, the future is bright. The future is good, and we need that peace, and we need that joy. And so, Lord, in a world that's so bent on offense and hurt, we need to be people who live in forgiveness and peace. And so, Lord, I just thank you for it right now. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for everyone in this room who has responded to this message. I just pray, Lord, that you give them hope and healing. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.